<laughs> okay, so so we have this Einstein person. So let's first let's see that had Einstein followed our this simple geometric approach to obtain this equation, to write this equation, he would have realized that lambda is a true constant of space-time structure. So, <coughs> when, when there is no better present, space-time goes to a homogeneous state of constant curvature. Mm -hmm. Not only that, something else he would have and that would have been the more important. He would have made the, the most remarkable and greatest predictions of all times after, after the Friedman's discovery of uh, expanding universe solution. solution of equation he would have said that sometime in future <coughs> lambda which had an had a repulsive uh, uh, <coughs> repulsive uh, for uh, gravitational force will might dominate over the matter density. And so the accelerated expansion of the universe the universe should have been a prediction. He would have made a prediction that this should have been a prediction. So it's not to come out as a great surprise in 1997 when it is actually measured or observed. It should come out, come have been a really a prediction. Of course, the great man wouldn't have been around in 97. But had he done this, we would have once again saluted the genius of the genius. So, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So it didn't become a prediction. And instead he left us with this confusion about Lebra. <coughs> but what really what we now have is, is that Lebra is for the first time observationally measured in this supernova observation in 97. It is in the same context like the velocity of light, the universal velocity was measured in a physical phenomena called the electromagnetic wave. So <coughs> that's that that picture. So that's the one point I wanted to ask you say. Oh, now I to get back to where we yesterday started and uh, we, we had this problem about the vacuum energy. So vacuum energy. So the question we should ask is Vacuum energy has the TAB of the same form as lambda G. So if you compute, it's a, a space tensor relative to flat space, then it exactly has the same form of lambda G. In, for in the classical way, 
the TAB being of the lambda GAB is actually is a stress tensor for corresponding to a constant potential potential. The potential the your scalar field, you have a so your kinetic term, then the phi, then you have a term with the phi. Yes, so your V phi whatever you you say that yes, the potential is constant, so there is no kinetic term, you have only the constant thing, and that constant will give you a TAB as lambda, lambda times GAB. <coughs> and we found that, that if we treat this, so, here, if we are uh, in uh, Einstein equation, if we add TAB of vacuum energy, the vacuum quantum fluctuations, which will be exactly of the same form as this lambda. And then, of course, you have to, you, so in the vacuum energy, this constant, will involve the Planck length and so then you compare the Planck length against the uh, constant le lambda the Gaussian lambda which comes from the cosmology is of the order of uh, 10 to minus 55 uh, centimeters square you know. and uh, so then this you have this uh, monstrous number coming out. So, order of 121. That the Planck cost length is larger than the, uh, this uh, lambda by this order of magnitude. Now, this called kind of a number We cannot digest. So you said, okay, lambda is fine, but it cannot represent the vacuum energy. And but it should have something to do with this. So you started beating lambda with this. To that, I asked now a question. So many times. Uh, you have a, this sort of a problem, you should really question the very existence of a thing. So the question we should hear then comes about is, we start to say, what does the letter That's vacuum energy. Gravitated by a stress tensor. It is only then this guy has a that should we really write a stress tensor to get the gravitational interaction of vacuum energy. But you might as well say, but what you said, you have, we have said gravity is universal. Energy in any form must gravitate. And so must do the vacuum energy. To answer to that is yes. Vacuum energy must also gravitate. But the question is, how should it gravitate? Should it necessarily gravitate through a, a stress tensor? Or should it gravitate through a, some much more subtler way? And you ask this question. So, we, so this question becomes meaningful. 
First thing we should ask is what is the character of the vacuum energy? Vacuum energy is created by metal fields. So I have a metal fields that uh, excite the vacuum and so it is created by metal fields. So that is that. But now, so that means vacuum energy does not have an independent existence of form, its own. For its existence, first you require a metal field. There should be some metal field to disturb the vacuum, to create the vacuum fluctuations, and it, those fluctuations have the energy there we associate is the vacuum energy. So this has no independent energy. <coughs> exactly it's on the same footing as we had the metal field creates the gravitational field That has the energies, which we call the self-interaction. Which has, says the same thing. <coughs> that, that has no independent existence. It's a, only when the gravity exists, that the gravity is not the, the, the self-interaction. So, the vacuum energy, and the self-interaction are on the same footing. They are of same, same character. <coughs> and so now we ask, how did we take into account the, the gravitational interaction of self-interaction? Did we write the stress tension on the right? The answer is no. We don't know. And that we yesterday all argued out and in a quite in detail to say that the self interaction or the gravitational field energy cannot gravitate through a stress tensor. It can only gravitate through enlarging the framework. And the enlargement of the framework there was curving the space. So when you curve the space, the self-interaction got automatically taken care of. So, so you said no, no stress tensor. <coughs> But instead, we had an enlargement of the framework that is from flat space, and I'm talking about space, is that free space to curved space. So the first question then we have this is the vacuum energy shares this property that it is a secondary effect like this thing. So vacuum energy is also a secondary effect. It's a secondary source, it's not a primary source. It is created by the primary source metal field. And yesterday I had proposed a, a principle to say all secondary sources 
gravitate not by through a stress tensor but in a much subtler manner by enlarging the framework. So the first question here comes about is to say people writing this stress tensor proportional to lambda DAB on the right of the equation. That is not well, that's not correct. And you should <coughs> Of course, the question will remain. Then, how should it, how should it uh, gravitate? Uh, how should we enlarge the framework? Now, the problem about that is a serious one because vacuum energy is a quantum creature. And I will not know that how the framework should be enlarged unless I have a quantum theory of gravity. So it is asking the same thing. Suppose Einstein was in Prague in 1912. And if you had asked this question to him in 1912, how will self-interaction self be taken care of? In 1912, he wouldn't have known the, how this framework should be enlarged to include the gravitational reaction. It's only when he get his theory, then, of course, we see, as we saw this, that uh, you have a gravity requires the curvature of space-time so where space curving of the space got automatically included and that's how the vacuum energy no, sorry the self-interaction was there. so same should be the story here that the stress stress say the vacuum energy uh, how should it gravitate we won't know until we have a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, let me say some here, one other point to criticize. When you do this, people, <coughs> so when you are writing the stress tensor as lambda GAB, for the vacuum energy, right? Then we know this has an equation of state rho plus p equal to zero. All these are constant equal to lambda, and so. And the T's are rho minus P minus P minus P. So this has the rho plus P equal to zero. Now what is this rho plus P? <coughs> so for a fluid equation of motion, we all know this, that rho plus P U dot A is minus P A the gradient of the pressure. Right? Anything multiplying the U dot, the acceleration, is what? What multiplies an acceleration what is it? Mass. Mass. It's, it's a mass, right? Which what mass? It is an inertial mass. So these are the density. So this is a so rho plus p is the inertial density, right? You could have a one general 
intuitive principle in your mind, whenever the inertial thing vanishes, so if any, any inertial entity, whether it is mass or density or anything else you say, if that is zero, then it signals what? It tells you something very, in, very profound. So get back to sick. When the inertial mass, when you have the particle whose inertial mass is zero, then what happened to the mechanics? The mechanics you know was no longer capable of including a zero mass particle. So what thing otherwise says that whenever an inertial entity vanishes, it signals the breakdown of your theory. Whatever theory that may be, and ask for a new theory. Zero mass particle. So the first is, so first question is, the whenever the inertial entity vanishes, the first thing we must realize is that this cannot be included in the existing theory. For this inclusion, we require a new theory. Like, zero mass particle could not be included in the Newtonian mechanics, and for this inclusion, we require a new theory of special relativity. Right? <coughs> so similarly, when the inertial density thing vanishes, implies that it cannot be included in the existing theory general relativity. So how should the inertial the how should the vacuum energy gravitate this question cannot be answered in general relativity. And you require so you require a new theory. So this we demand this requires a new theory. And the new theory of course should be the theory of quantum gravity or quantum space time. Both would be the same. <coughs> so that question so now I I would propose the one of the motivations, the most driving motivation for me is that why do you require a quantum gravity? We require a quantum gravity to understand gravitational interaction of vacuum energy. So, so quantum gravity is required for uh, <coughs> to give us, tell us how should, how does vacuum energy uh, gravity? So that so this is so hey, there are numerous motivations for quantum gravity. But this is, to me, one of the direct things directly coming from that, purely the gravitational consideration. That we require a quantum theory of gravity to understand the 
Weet jy my net iets in trekse nie? Jy dit op dit is nie in trekse. En die hens het sê, since it cannot be included, so this question about comparing Lembra with this plank lane doesn't rise. This is all meaningless. So Lembra is a constant of space-time structure at the velocity of light and it can have any value what the observations determine. There's no, <laughs> nothing must do it. So then we might ask this, and I said, okay, so the question here remains unanswered. And so I, my answer is will be that I, I will not know it until I have a quantum theory of gravity, which I don't have. So we have to wait how the vacuum energy uh, should be. <coughs> should be. Uh, should be. Uh, should grow it. Uh, unfortunately, physicists are never happy with this kind of an uncertain situation. They say, okay, true what you say is all right. But that doesn't mean that we should not keep on trying under the name of what you call Effective theories. You keep on building effective theories, which are not so much principle driven, but it's, they are more phenomenology driven. And there is a whole branch of phenomenology uh, really prospering in uh, high energy physics, so where you keep on proposing formulas and tweaking it here and there to fit some curve or the other. Now, that technology, I'm saying, is, is also useful. I'm pretty sure that that, that kind of work probably may not lead us to the ultimate to the theory, but it helps in developing the technological tools, which will be very useful in general. So it's that I would look at as a general exercise of uh, the things. <coughs> One might say that, okay, we don't know this. And how the framework could be enlarged, do we, can, can we make some guess? So I, with our experience, that to get zero mass particle in, we bounded space and time together into space time. And what it required was an inversal velocity. <coughs> then to get zero mass particle to feel gravity, we came over to curve space time. That gave us the So this is, these are all the enlargements of the framework. So I, I think yeah, to that my question one should also add that not only zero mass particles motion was not included in Newtonian mechanics, zero mass particles interaction with gravity is also not included in Newtonian gravity. In Newtonian gravity, zero mass particles can feel no gravity. So again, so that you say zero mass particle could not be included in Newtonian gravity or Newtonian mechanics and hence you required a new theory, new mechanics and new theory of gravity. Now we have a similar situation <coughs> that I have a new entity called vacuum energy which has a things corresponding to the inertial mass and the inertial density which is zero and hence it cannot be included in the, in the existing theory of general relativity and you need a new theory of quantum gravity so that but now you might then 
that we all along have been talking about that we need an enlargement of the framework. We have this two very successful experience of enlarging the framework for special relativity and general relativity. Can we make a some guesswork that how to include the the grace work here? Well, we might the thing which we have to do is only the space time we have. We are talking about the gravity and gravity is the property of space time. So you have a Space time, what things you can do to space time? Just imagine what, what can you do? You have carved it, that is, is there anything else could you do? And the possible situation is, one thing could be, probably we could consider high dimension, And this could have a very attractive uh, thing, the right? When we came from Newton to the relativity, what you did? You curved the space time, Newton's law remained intact one of R square, and the curvature of the space took care of the light light's interaction with gravity. So, beautiful synthesis. Here, possi the, the possibility could be this, that on four space time, your general relativity holds good, like the Newton's law being valid. And vacuum energy might interact through higher dimensions. We have no idea of this thing, but this is a possibility. If this happens, this is isn't an attractive possibility. This is exactly like what would happen. And ultimate answer, I would believe, would be something like this, where the GR remains intact, remains intact. The new thing, the vacuum energy interaction, is taken by care by the new thing you introduce due to the space time. <coughs> uh, another possibility with, with this, and we are saying that it's a quantum theory of gravity, and gravity sits in the space time curvature, so which means the space time also at, to, at the deep down should have a discrete quantum structure. So, other possibility is of uh, the space time being discrete. With now that you, 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 the thing is that quantum gravity may be one of the two or two together, we don't know. So these, these are the uh, possible enlargements we could think of and we have no answer to this how, how it comes about but this may be this so possibly either something from this happens or something else altogether which we have not thought about could come so the question of so the the vacuum energy's interaction with gravity remains open till we have a quantum gravity. So that is the that is the picture. That the hard fact of life you have to accept. We should learn to accept that this question will remain unanswered till we come to this. Okay. <coughs> now let me now yesterday I made a statement, let me Give, give a little rejoinder to this. 
And Vera Vata was trying, he was telling you this. The sea and the are the two most, most fundamental constants. Because these are the only two which are incorporated, synthesized in the structure of space-time. No other constant can claim uh, this aspect. No. So that's right. But then I also said that between C and lambda, which is more phenomenal. And then I said was that perhaps the C is more fundamental uh, because lambda equal to zero is admitted. Nothing untowards happened. I can take lambda equal to zero. You have. So that right, the way the lambda has been introduced, we, we say it can have a value greater than zero, or less than zero, or equal to zero. All three are possibilities are allowed. Whereas C equal to zero is not allowed. <coughs> but then Later on, again, I thought about it. Now, that's not the right way to look at this thing. There are two ways from which you should take the limit. Either the constant becomes is zero, or the constant becomes infinite. So, for the C, what is allowed is C tending to infinite. This is allowed. So, lambda and C are really dual to each other. For lambda, lambda tending to infinity is not allowed. For C, C tending to zero is not allowed, but C tending to infinity is allowed. C tending to infinity gives you back the my Newtonian mechanics. <coughs> Here, lambda tending to zero gives me the original Einstein equation. So, I rejoin that is that no, at the level of fundamentalness, both are at the same footing. One can't say C is more fundamental than lambda or Y. So C and lambda both are constants of space-time structure. Both are part of the space-time structure. And both of them are the, have the same degree of fundamentalness. Except they admit to dual limits. One admits the limit g zero, other admits the limit infinite. <coughs> okay. So so far as gravity was concerned, I think I should conclude here. Now let me get or do something. Oh no, maybe ah, something more to say. I said this. Now the people like Philip, higher dimensions are most natural because that is where the stupid string theory is. It's a natural playground for string theory. But now let's ask, say that, can by simple classical physics or classical gravity, can we make arguments which which require higher dimensions, or which at least 
pose the possibility this higher dimensions gravity so question which we are going to say gravity might not fully remain confined in the four dimensional space time it may require it may rather leak into higher dimensions and there i wish to go do give you three purely classical arguments So the first argument is one. Gravity is defined by the curvature of spacetime, right? So in particular, let's say that of Riemann curvature. Now, how do I know? that it remains confined to the given dimension that is i define this in the given dimension it's an intrinsic curvature i did you define but how do i know that its property its information does not leak into higher dimensions Now, to that, I want to propose a simple, again, a common sense idea, and that is to say that I have a this curved space time. If I can embed it in a higher dimensional flat space time, then I would say no curvature information is transmitted to the higher dimensions. So. we ask the question is is embedding in higher d flat so you have four dimensional space time if i can embed this in a five dimensional flat space time then i would say yes The all this curvature information remains confined in four dimension. Curvature information means the gravity remains confined. So all gravitational information is within this. Then with this discussion, of course now you address to the mathematicians, and it turns out that the arbitrarily curved. For this space time, requires ten dimension for its flat image. So this tells you about this. Yes. Can you just give more, a little bit more details on embedding? What, hmm? what, uh, what, what does it mean that uh, you four dimensions can be embedded in ten dimensions? What? No, no. So, start, so, 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 so let's say, okay. Start from the simple thing. You have a two D curved space. Your Earth has a sphere, right? This can be. Isometrically embedded in three-dimensional flat space, mm -hmm. and as, as a matter of fact, we conceive, we see curvature through the embedding. Yeah, if we live on 2D, suppose we are 2D creatures, we will not be able to perceive it as a curvature. Mm -hmm. So it is always in a higher dimension through which you perceive. 
Now, as the, as, as you know, as the dimensions increase, differential geometry becomes more and more complicated. So here, for so to make a more statement, like if you have a <coughs> your Robertson conformally flat space times, like Robertson Walker space time. That can be embedded into five dimensional flat space. That embedding is that we all, always. So, so you said. So there also there is a question. Well, uh, of course, since we are here, to, so let me pose the question. This. So we know this. When y curvature is zero. So when there is a Robertson, your Robertson Walker uh, space time, or the Schwarzschild interior solution, which is also conformally flat, that they can be embedded in 5D flat space time. That's However, the reverse is not, converse is not. We also have a, we have a situation that where y is not zero, yet it is available in five dimensions. So there is an example of this. <coughs> but I, I would, uh, so here the thing is, with the, I think probably the mathematicians can, can come in. Can we prove at least this in general? So this I only gave you two examples. That whenever y is zero, it is always embeddable in five dimensional flat space. And uh, I think this is a, a, a very interesting question. And, uh, and so far I know it's not answered yet. And this should be developed. It should be a very clean analytical problem for one to take on this. Then we might miss. On the other hand, you say, okay, or good. The well known familiar Schwarzschild solution. It cannot be embedded in five dimensional flat. It requires six dimensions for its flat embedding. So that's why Schwarzschild exterior solutions require six dimensions for flat embedding. So what does this so I'm saying it's an intuitive argument, it's a physical common sense argument to say that grab arbitrarily curved space time is curvature information perhaps penetrates down to ten dimensions. But Schwarzschild is four dimensional, right? So Schwarzschild is four dimensional. But why it can be embedded in six? Huh? So it can be embedded in six, not in ten, right? So, no, no, huh. so it's 10 is the maximum. Okay. This, so 10, where, where, did, where did I write that 10? On the left, left side. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is the maximum. You could, so if you have more symmetries, you could have a lower, mm -hmm. lower uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is an example for, for this, like climb bottom is a 2D surface. Mm -hmm. It's just you have. And then you identify the opposite sides and the is <coughs> and the opposite side or yeah. both, yeah? and yeah. you cannot embed in 3D. So normally, like normally curved yeah. 2D sphere, you can you can 2D surface you can easily visualize in 3D, but fine bottom you cannot. So if you see mm -hmm. some, have you seen like it's a bottom which yeah. 
Yeah. She's throwing it, she's yeah. going to play itself. So you, yeah. you would see it not crossing each other in 4D only. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, we don't imagine going both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. It's similar in it's shoot. Shoot. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah. Right. It's six dimensions, not five. So that, 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 that's the sort of example you have. So this gives you one indication that the, it's the, uh, uh, the, the it's for this space time not in general being embeddable in 5D flat gives you indication that the, probably the gravitational information leaks into high dynamics. Okay, <coughs> that's one. the next. So that's one line. Pure again, purely uh, classical. The second could be this. What do you have? We have a gravity is a self-interacting force, right? And like what he said yesterday. The self-interaction is what you have. You you have a given field, and then you take its uh, higher orders. So you have a say electric field, and if you want to examine uh, in a very strong field limits where you want this to have. So instead of f, you will be taking to so take f squared. The same question should be asked the gravity. So gravity, what do you have? You have the Riemann curvature. To include that uh, your the thing, you should take its higher, higher powers of Riemann curvature. So say quadratic. So which is to say the Lagrangian should have a higher power of the Riemann. It should be non-linear. And whatever the order you want to go. But then, of course, we ask, yes, again, you can include the higher orders of things. But we demand your theory to be a good theory, free of all hosts and undesirable Creatures, you demand that equation should remain second order. Then, this polynomial of the Lagrangian gets identified with a specific polynomial and that's called Lovelock. As I said the other day, this polynomial is a homogeneous in Riemann curvature of any degree you want. And the most remarkable property of this is, despite it being a polynomial in the Riemann curvature, which involves the second derivative, its variation still gives me a second order request. So, beautiful thing about this, all higher order derivatives under variation which you get, they all get cancelled out and you, the, your equation of motion for gravity still remains second order. That's so now you I said okay to probe the strong regime regimes of gravity's gravity higher orders of this Lagrangian I must take and then if I demand the order to be second order then the level of contribution in the equation, the higher order contribution, is non-zero only for d greater than 4. 
So in D equal to 4, the contribution from the Lovelock Lagrangian is 0. So here again we get an indication, again purely from, from classical considerations, that if you want to probe the <coughs> uh, strong, strong regimes of gravity, which means I should in, include the high powers of the human curvature, then that the, uh, your strong regime effects will be only non-trivial in dimensions greater than 4. So that gives you that you you have to take the uh, high dimensions. That's one. Third, lastly, again, purely a or common sense argument three. That is to say, there is a one general principle for all classical fields that the total charge must be zero. That if you sum over all charges electric charges. Oh. No. no. Charge parameters. Charge is a charge parameter which which is is for a specific field. It could be gravitational charge, it could be electric charge, it could be weak charge, it could be strong charge, or any other fundamental field you might have. The total charge must be must be zero. And of course, we all know about charge from our electromagnetic understanding of our electromagnetic field. So, how are the electric charges created? You start with a, some neutral entity, like an atom. Then you kick out one electron. So, kicked out electron, suppose call that has a negative charge. So, that is your negative charge. What remains behind has a positive charge. Right? Now you are saying that all this positive and negative charge in the universe you sum over, then the negative charge will totally balance the positive charge. The total charge should remain is always zero. So that's, that's the general principle. So this is fine as we understand for, elect, for the electromagnetic field, for the electric charge. That's perfectly fine, and we really, uh, th that's what has motivated us to ask this question. Now, this I am saying, this is a general principle. This should be true for all fields. So, and our consideration is, how about gravity? There is a problem here. Because the electric charge is bipolarity. And so you polarity you come. To. But the gravity is unipolar. I don't have a I don't have a negative mass to balance it out. But if this principle has to be true, then it must also have its so you have its uh, charge is your metal distribution, TAB, but that 
This is unipolar. You say that the energy, your, uh, or your TAB satisfies the positive mass or positive energy condition. But then we said, yes, but there is something else has gravity, which doesn't have, the other fields have. It also has a gravitational field energy. Its field also is energy. Actually, and it has a charge of opposite polarity. So gravity, so say mass produces gravitational field, and the only way this could be counter is that this field which has energy, that energy must have opposite polarity. And so you have a mass point here. This field is distributed all over the, the space. So if you integrate for its field energy over all over the space, then its mass is say m, and the integration from this, this will give you that exactly at minus m. And so that is how the total charge, gravitational charge, will, will be zero when you sum over all over things. And this is rigorously, this fact is produced by in this famous paper we all talk, you all come about, ADM, Almovit, Deja, and Wiesner, 1961. <coughs> the, so if you uh, think like, so if you have a uh, distribution, the gravitational field will entirely eat up the positive mass that you have. So that, that, so that's, and this is not curly, that's one thing, another thing people are there. This is what tells you why the gravity should be attractive. Well, if you always get kept on wondering, you have watched, Two, ma two masses always attract. Two masses, both have a positive mass. Why should they attract? They attract because your interaction energy, the field energy, the field energy is negative. So that, so, the another way of really looking at whether the field is attractive or repulsive is asking from whether the field energy, interaction energy is positive or negative. When interaction energy is positive, then the field is repulsive. When interaction energy is negative, then the field is attractive. And so this is that the demanding, the total charge being zero gives you the simplest explanation for why gravity is always positive. Now we do have something more to this. So now let us say we have a mass point here. And let me consider a three ball around it of radius r. <coughs> so now I will claim the total gravitational charge here in this. will be 
larger. Ah, okay. Uh, let me see other way around. That yes. The positive charge will be greater than the negative charge in this because positive charge is mass m negative charge in the gravitational field but the gravitational field i in only include up to some radius r the field line outside this i have cut off if i integrate it to the whole space then the positive the, the negative charge mass coming from the field energy would have totally be balancing the angle. So now if I take a radius r here and cut it off, that means there is a, here there is an overdominance of positive charge. On any surface, if there is an overdominance of a charge, what does it tell you? that the field propagates of the surface. Like you have a charge two sphere. Charge in non zero, electric field is in of the surface. So here now imagine now we have to go to the one more dimension more to say that I have a three sphere. Inside this I have an over dominance of the positive mass, positive charge, then the gravity must propagate of this three space. Of the three space means, now we are told the time is separate. So it has to propagate in the extra space dimension. So it has to propagate in uh, uh, higher D. However, its propagation in a higher D, higher dimension, is not going to be is not going to be free propagation, not the zero mass propagation. Because, so say it is as it is propagating out, then as it goes out. It is going to include the negative energy of the field which I had at least excluded by blocking at the top. So what does it mean? That it will propagate out with a diminishing field strength. Its field strength will keep on diminishing. So as essentially uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, you, another way of looking at in the, your particle physics language is saying that it has it has gravitational constant for this situation becomes running. It is it is decreasing as it is goes out. So then, what it tells you is that the gravity that does propagate out. But it cannot propagate out deep end. So, like here, in four dimension, it, dimension is infinite. Gravity propagates out to infinity everywhere. In fact, in the higher dimension, gravity cannot propagate out to large dimension. So, it, so it remains confined to the neighborhood of the your three ball. So what it tells you is the gravity may propagate out, can propagate out in higher dimension but not deep in. <coughs> and he, that is why higher dimensions are always small. They cannot be large. Here again the question is, how do I probe a dimension? So dimensions I probe 
through the field probes I have. So I, I do an electric experiment from that I so now so all your matter fields are the gauge vector fields. Right? And then and the gauge vector fields remain confined to four dimensions. They are only conformally invariant only in four dimensions more. So what happens is your matter field can remain confined to the four dimensions. That's the problem. Gravity can propagate into the higher dimension, but not deep enough. <coughs> and because there are no other fields, so that is and that is why since gravity cannot propagate in, in the higher dimension uh, the deep enough, that gives that high dimension has to be small. And that's also the reason that why do I not see high dimension? I do not see high dimension because they are, it is small. Now this is the picture, which is a very intuitive picture as I am saying, is exactly the picture what our brain world scenario puts you. The brain world scenario, you have absolutely the same picture. The gravity propagates in higher dimension, but not deep enough. And that is not, uh, not, to, uh, not to let it go uh, deeper, you have those wedge potentials. <coughs> so that's, so here from a purely a common sense argument, you get to this, and so two things I have to say, that this very intuitive argument beautifully explains why the gravity is always attractive. Second thing, gra why gravity cannot propagate deep in higher dimension. And by that, that means that uh, High dimensions cannot be large, they have to be small. Whether they have to be compact or not, that I don't know, but yes, they have to be small. But this all matches well with the what the, the string theorists want. Uh, my only problem with them is that these simple arguments of Classical argument for the higher dimensions, the string theorists don't like. For, for them, the higher dimensions is their monopoly. <laughs> that it can only be looked to like this rather than that. Okay. All right. <coughs> so that's the one. Now let me come to a even much, much more slippier slippery thing. And since I'm an old enough man, I can afford to be stupid. And that's where I would like to ask, I, I do two things uh, quickly enough. And that is, so I start with the one first to propose that how I distinguish a fundamental force from all other forces. And my claim is the fundamental force, dynamics of a fundamental force is uh, its fourth law must not be prescribed. It must follow from a, some very general principle. In general, it should follow from the geometry of, let's say, 
appropriate first time. And it's the geometry that should dictate it. What should be the equation most? What should be the force law? So first let us consider the most general space-time available to us and that is your, say, your Riemann space. And we have seen that gives us the equation of motion of the Einstein gravity. And that we obtain without invoking anything else. So the dynamics of Einstein gravity is dictated by the geometry of space-time. Now my claim is I should be able to do the same for all other fundamental forces as well. Of course, I have to find an appropriate space-time problem, which is applicable. <coughs> so you have an and here the critical thing, critical differential geometric property was your Bianchi identity. Uh, or you say that Bianchi derivative to so Remember that we should keep that this is going to play the important role. So the, we have seen the equation of uh, motion for gravity in the universal force follows from the geometry of Riemannian space-time manifold. <coughs> all, all by itself. But so that so that gravity is, we have taken is accounted for. And uh, this is why the Riemannian space-time you have no restriction on this. We call the you know, the force which it creates is the universal force. It describes the universal force. Now let's ask the question to that this is the most general space time. And that only can address the universal force. Now if a force is not universal, means it links to say particular charge it doesn't link to all particles but it links to a, some specific charge then it stands to reason that my space-time cannot be Romanian general this thing but there should be some restricted space-time which addresses this restriction of a of a charge that so essentially saying the space time is a so now geometrically you have a space time what other thing you could what other kind of space time you can imagine one space time which we generally say you could have a space time of tangent bundles. That every point you consider a tangent, tangent bundle. So you could have a space time of a I'll take the now these things I don't understand very much. I just copy what the people tell me. Uh, principles 
in India. You have a fiber bundle and the so now, like I had the demand curvature for this, I have a corresponding curvature for this, and that is less is a RPB. It's a two form and this matrix tensor F. It satisfies That's a differential derivative tells us satisfy the BIT identity, or which would mean that uh, anti summarized derivative, or which is another way of saying that uh, del A of F star A B equals to zero, where F star is that post dual of f. This must be. What does that mean? This. So like the BIT identity for the Riemann tensor told us the Riemann tensor is the generalized curve, curve of a connection. Here, this PIT identity tells you that F is a curl of a vector. So what do you let's, oh, let's call keep on the thing. Some del B A minus del A B. And it is anti-symmetric. Now here there is one tricky thing uh, where we will have a departure from the gravitational uh, case. And that was how do we define the free state? Free your principal tangent bundle space time. Absence of the force. What did you in the, in the gravitational case you had? It's turned out the Riemann curvature is constant. Right? But I, here I don't have that. Because your FAB if you take that as goal zero that is non-trivial I have a constant electric field so that's not it but then it turns out that there are two ways of, so I, I said this is a, uh, but at the same time we said this, this space time is maximal this yeah. What does it mean? So in the gravity, it meant that your GAB lead derivative of this relative to a killing direction must be zero. And these killing directions, it being maximally symmetric, are 10. So I have a, this should be true for the all 10 killing vectors. And this fact was equivalent to gravity that the Riemann curvature is constant. But these two things were equal. However, here that is not the case. 
So here we have to say the free space time, absence of uh, your the of the field is to be uh, this. So here then what you have? That you will have killing vector and that very very well here is the gas potential A. And so gas potential A, so let's say this sort of we'll call it A is a good line. This should be zero for all ten K. Then this implies F A B zero. So right. So the free bundle space time is when the F vanishes. Whereas in the gravity case, the maximal symmetry keeps me, does not ask Riemann to be zero. It asks Riemann to be constant. <coughs> so I have this. Now I do everything. So as usual, I, I do very simple things. Right? So I have a, so FAB is anti-symmetric, uh, then if I take the covariant derivatives, double covariant derivatives, This is zero because of anti Then we do our usual trick of integrating things without integration. So this is zero, which means I can write FAB semicolon B equal to some J A with the demand that J is conserved. So I got the Maxwell equation. So we so you have a Tangent bundle space, the curvature of the tangent bundle space, in the same way as the curvature of Riemann space gives me the Einstein gravity equation, curvature of the of the tangent bundle space gives me the Maxwell equation. So I got the now you say, okay, this I do. So the moment I have this vector field, that gives me another liberty of decorating this F with some internal indices. So you could have, so now you could say, can I have some internal non abelian uh, index and the whole argument this whole thing will go through of course you will now define your derivative as the gauge invariant covariant derivative and all this thing will go over and that will give you depending upon what is the dimension of i you want to keep it will give you whether it is three components you want or you want eight components will give you the weak force and similarly if you want the eight components that will give you the strong force. So the question is and the 
Only the fundamental forces of what we know, one is gravity, all others are fall into this, your uh, vector gauge fields, and they all could be. So the dynamics of all the vector field gauge fields can follow from the curvature of or the geometry of uh, <coughs> geometry of the principal tangent bundle of the bundle space time. On the same way, the Einstein gravity dynamics follows from the space time curvature. So that was my thing that the dynamics of all fundamental forces should be derivable from the geometry of the corresponding space time. Now the last question, my crazy way of looking at the unification of uh, all the four forces and that is So first, let's say a universe. Or so the how how does the force is characterized? Force is characterized by two kind of things. Its linkage and its reach. How far is, does it go? And to what does it link to? Who does it affect? If we say that the force is universal, then it does both. It links to all and it reaches everywhere. So it has a long range. Right? With this property, we have uniquely found that that universal force is Einstein gravity. So I would really like to look at Einstein gravity and the mother force. Like you said, this is mother of all evils. So, you. And then I say that all other forces I will obtain as I lift these two properties. And so let's see that I suppose now I say go to the next force to say that the reach is infinite so which means it's long range but linkage is to a specific charge. That it links to a particular charge, like say electric charge. 
But since we said that the child is particular, and we always say, by the lack of mind, the total charge must be zero. So, so this this should be a bipolar space, bipolar field. A bipolar field can only be described by a vector field. So it will be a yes vector field. When it is abelian, this will give me my, give you the metal phase. So, we get to the next one that field by relaxing the property of linkage from universal to a specific term. Now let us <coughs> do other thing. Uh, so this is one. So that is your electric force. Next, you consider the condition, and where you say that <coughs> linkage universal. But with that thing, and uh, reach confined. So it's a short range. So in this thing, there are only four possibilities you have. One being inversion. Then you lift this, retain this. And then you say you lift both of them. That neither the link, this or the, so you you will get the, uh, oh, oh, uh, sorry, what, what did I say? So one is when both these are satisfied, that is your gravity. Second, when you say you retain this and lift this, that gives you you the electric force. Next you say that <coughs> you have lift this that short range but keep universality, linkage universal. And fourth will be when you lift that both the reach as well as linkage that the short range and also linkage to a specific charge. So these are the four possibilities you have and I claim that these four possibilities correspond to the four fundamental forces we, we know. So here when we say that we have a short range, now the short range in, in what way? In, there are only two ways you can make a force sort. So how do you make a force sort range? One, you say, make the propagator massive so that that it is it is not zero mass propagator zero mass propagator will take the force to <coughs> uh, another way to do is what we did here. The gravity cannot propagate deep in in higher dimension. And there that confinement 
Why the gravity was made a short range in higher dimension? The coupling was running. The coupling constant is not constant, so you have a running coupling. <coughs> this tube is. So now, the third possibility we want to say, you want the least to be short range. So let us say the short range thing is, least is short range, the propagator is massive. And linkage universal means within the within the confinement of short range and that means universal in terms of to all massive particles so it links to all massive particles and its propagator is is uh, uh, <coughs> is massive and this is your weak force of course when we set it with this picture I have it makes some predictions which are not normally saying this so for example in this picture neutrino has to be massive it cannot be massless because anything that participates in weak interaction must be massive. So the neutrino in, in, in this picture, the neutrino has to be massive. Neutrino is the massive, zero mass neutrino is not uh, admitted here. Other thing is, uh, well, you have a but left-handed electron I know. So there is a something to the that only uh, only one electron who have seen this. And to that my question is that you should look deep enough you will find that too. So left-handed electron we do not see any interaction with the big force, but that that must come in future. Uh, experiments. So, so that's the week. And now you do the two things. The next possibility is where you relax both the thing. Neither the force is long range nor the linkage is universal. So linkage to a particular charge and the force is, uh, is also short range. And so here we have the, uh, your, so the linkage to a particular charge and the range is a short range, is short, and this short range is by running coupling. Interestingly, this running coupling we also had for the gravity when the gravity remains confined to the uh, small high dimension. There the coupling was, the gravitational coupling was beating, becoming weaker and weaker as you go. In this case, we have an opposite way. The coupling becomes stronger and stronger with the distance. And that is how you make it confirm. And at zero, at r equal to zero, the coupling goes to zero. And that is what gives you the asymptotic freedom and keeps your uh, protons all confined to the nucleus. <coughs> so, so
So you uh, with this picture, this corresponds to the straw. Now here I would say the first two, the mother force and the electric force. I can prove them to be unique. The gravitational force being universal, Einstein gravity is unique. Similarly, the electric force, bipolarity in this view, again it uh, gives you the Maxwell electrodynamics as unique. However, for the other these quantum forces, which unfortunately uh, they do not uh, really uh, are not uh, fine to understand this simple, simple-minded classical understanding of things. So here, what I'm saying is that weak and strong forces. Uh, are the possible ones, but I can't prove them to be that they would be the only unique one. So you have a, this very interesting future. So finally, thing let's ask this, this way: that this gives you a kind of. A, uh, Duality suggestion <coughs> So one is universal linkage, one is the link and other is the range. Now you see electric force. and the weak force. They are dual to each other. Why? The electric force is not universal linkage but long range. The weak linkage is universal in a, a given context and the range is short. They are opposite. So one has a long range, other has a short range, one has a, a linkage to a specific charge, other has a universal linkage only to mass, all massive particles. And so you would expect there should be a duality connection between them. And that again is strongly going that we have a kind of electro weak unification. So that's a right view. So in an appropriate space, so to say, we should really see sometimes a duality between electric force and the weak force and vice versa. Similarly, the gravity where both linkage and the range. Linkage universal, range long. And it's supposed that the strong force defies both, neither. Neither the linkage universal, nor the range long. So it's actually a 
the gravity, the strong force is opposite of. And so, like here you have an electroweak this thing. Similarly, there should be some duality relation or some resonance things we should look for between gravity and the strong force. Now there are some indications of this. And I have a, my friend's string previous year. So it turns out that if you when you wanted to understand strong force in the strength theory framework, you had the propagator particle had a massless but spin spin two with that and everybody wanted that it should be spin one and they all did calculation and finally they have to agree that it is really a spin two so we said an indication only and then you have this very famous everybody is like uh, as your ADS CFT correspondence. Where what you have? You have ADS space time, which is a space time. The moment I have a space time geometry, I am saying that, is a, that is a gravitational entity. Now you say on the boundary of it, they find a conformal field theory. Now, I must say here that ADS space time in my perception has no gravity. It's a, it's a gravity free space time. However, it is a curved space time. So there is a link, so first link hint we have got is a curved space time on its boundary sits a conformal field theory, which is not the field theory of a, not the strong force or something, but it is just some kind of a, a, a metal field theory you have. So that again gives you a, a sort of a duality connection between strong force and the gravity. So this is my simple-minded uh, way of looking at the unification of the four fundamental forces in a very simple-minded manner. They give you, you an attractive model how far does it sustain? I don't know. However, all I tend to say is this exercise should be able to suggest us some, some connections which we should explore. Like as we did for the electric and the wheel. Similarly, we should explore between gravity and the storm. I think that's where I'm run out of steam now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's almost 12. Oh, almost 12? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> good, good, good. So we can maybe uh, and discuss. Yes. yes, maybe only if somebody has some short questions before going to March.